Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh webinar in 12D's Industry Solutions webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator here at 12D Solutions. While we wait for everyone to finish joining, I'll launch a polling question. You'll have about 30 seconds to answer about whether you've experienced aquaplaning and then I'll show the results. Okay, it looks as though quite a few people have experienced aquaplaning on some occasions, so I think everyone will get a lot out of today's webinar. Let's get to it. Our industry solutions webinars are designed to provide insights into overcoming challenges in an evolving industry in more effective and efficient ways. We'll be running these webinars regularly and recording them for posting on our website and on YouTube. Our first six webinars from this industry solutions series as well as those, the first two webinars from our training series, are already available online if you missed those. During this live presentation, you'll be able to type your questions along the way, as shown on the screen, and we'll answer as many as possible throughout the webinar. At the end, I'll also read out some of your questions to the presenter for his insights. Today's webinar on aquaplaning will be presented by Owen Thornton, who has been writing software for 12D Solutions since 2003. Owen has 15 years professional experience in the civil and mining industries and is the original author of 12D's Drainage Network Editor and the Drainage Analysis Module. He's also a 12D specialist in drainage, utilities, plot parameter files, survey conformance, volumetrics and system setup. Owen has recent consulting experience using 12D model on a variety of large projects. These days, Owen also gives regular 12D training courses in drainage design and macro writing. This webinar will demonstrate a tool within 12D model which uses the Galloway equation, recommended by Ostroads, TMR, RMS and other industry bodies, to assess the risk of vehicle, vehicle aquaplaning at critical points on major roads. The tool is explained as a time-saving device for road and drainage designers to quickly produce color-coded graphical results and standardized reports to meet the specific requirements of road authorities. Over to you, Owen. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we are talking about aquaplaning and two uh, different methods that are, um, have been adopted by industry. Uh, for assessing the risk of aquaplaning. Uh, the two formulas are presented on the screen now. One is known as the Galloway equation, which was developed by uh, Mr. Galloway from uh, Texas in 1979. And another one from an older one from the Road Research Laboratory in the UK, uh, dated 1968. And both formulas are a, a little bit similar in that they're attempting to uh, estimate a depth of water film on the road surface and uh, the risk of aquaplaning is uh, said to be closely related to the depth of water film above the top of the pavement texture. Now obviously uh, you don't get water on the road unless it's raining um, so there's uh, an intensity, a rainfall intensity and that's uh, a big part of the estimation as well and what intensity should be used is a good question. Uh, there are questions of well can you actually drive a car when the intensity is too high and in fact most people naturally slow down uh, and typically a, uh, some intensity between 50 millimetres an hour and 100 millimetres an hour is used. It's normally, the low, it doesn't tend to go much lower than 50 um, but some places like in New Zealand they'll often use a five minute intensity, uh, a five minute duration uh, for a two year average recurrence interval which is often a bit higher than 50, maybe 70 or 80 millimetres per hour. Uh, another issue though with the rainfall intensity is that uh, even after a short burst of rain stops, the film depth can uh, linger on the road for quite a few minutes after the, the intense, intense burst has moved on off the road. And so it's quite a dangerous, particularly dangerous time there for drivers who suddenly have their visibility back as the rainfall has diminished but the film depth is still there on the road. And that's not really um, uh, anticipated by either of these methods at all. 
other things that this um, uh, these two formulas are de dependent on are length and slope. So typically, the longer the flow path, the higher the film depth, and the flatter the flow path, the higher the film depth. Also, in the case of the Galloway equation, uh, it considers the texture of uh, the average pavement texture depth, which the RRL or the UK equation, as I might refer to it, uh, does not. Uh, now certainly um, the RRL equation is typically considered more conservative in most cases, not all, but most cases, uh, and that's not altogether because of the texture depth. I say primarily it's because of the different um, index there on the slope on the denominator. So this one will tend to give a smaller denominator uh, for, lar for uh, slopes above unity. Uh, which will therefore give a larger depth. So that's the primary reason, in my opinion, why this formula uh, gives more, tends to give more conservative results, except for very low slopes. Uh, but that's uh, the, the two uh, formulas as presented. Both formulas um, uh, are presented with um, the caveat that around about the four millimetre mark is tends to be the critical film depth for when the risk of aquaplaning starts to become significant. There's also um, a, a range between 2.5 and 4 millimetres, uh, which is where the risk is considered going from a low risk up to a uh, high or unacceptable risk. Uh, again, these are not hard and fast numbers and uh, or, sorry, these are not uh, definitive numbers. There is some leeway, um, uh, and in some cases, film depths uh, can go higher than that without increasing the risk of aquaplaning. There are other factors as well, of course. Uh, it's also dependent on the kind of uh, road surface construction and the speed of the vehicles and the tyre pressure in the tyres and the kind of tyres and the kind of tyre tread and all of those sorts of things that are typically beyond uh, the control of a road designer. We can only, as road designers, control so many things and so the uh, methods we have for assessing aquaplaning are somewhat limited into the things we can uh, control. Looking at a quick comparison of the two methods, I mentioned before that the, uh, the uh, UK equation is somewhat more conservative than the Galloway equation on the left. So what I've got here is a table for a range of different slopes uh, in percent and a range of different flow path lengths ranging from one metre up to 60 metres. Uh, and there are the, the different depths here that are considered unacceptable. Four millimetres or more is considered an unacceptable risk and there's nominal risk um, uh, labels uh, high for 3.2, uh, between 3.2 and 4, and moderate between 2.5 and 3.2. Anything below 2.5 millimetres would be considered low risk for aquaplaning. Again, purely based on the water film depth that develops uh, along the flow path on the road. So what you can see here is, generally speaking, you can say that the UK equation is more conservative, except for the flatter grades. Anything flatter than about half a percent, um, then the Galloway equation is actually a, a little bit more conservative. Uh, and that uh, oftentimes is where the road gets flat, is where you um, do have the biggest problems with aquaplaning. Generally speaking, the Galloway equation is um, used almost exclusively in Australia now. Uh, it used to be that the UK equation was used, but there was a change in the 1980s. Uh, the UK equation is still used in New Zealand, even though they're in the process, it seems, of phasing it out. Uh, both equations are still in use in New Zealand, so um, the differences between the two uh, are important to understand uh, for the, and, and certainly there is enough evidence to suggest that the UK equation is less reliable than the Galloway equation um, for estimating the water film depth. I will point out as well that even though these charts go up to 60 metres in length, in both tests when these equations were developed, 
these equations here, in both cases, the actual testing rigs that were used were never longer, or the flow path length was never longer than 15 metres. So we don't really, we're, we've extrapolated data here and just assumed that it's going to be correct, but the validity of that assumption is not necessarily um, uh, clear. So the kinds of road geometry, and we will be looking at um, a 12D model soon showing some actual examples of some road geometry and the kind of testing you can do in 12D. But the road geometry that tends to increase the risk of acroplaning um, is, it's really quite simple. Uh, localised flat spots are the biggest red flag there is. If you've got localised flat spots, it's, it generally causes more issues than just aquaplaning too. It generally means that your pavement um, will uh, tend to be saturated in those kinds of areas and will wear out faster. So a lot of people are look on the lookout for localised flat spots, but it does tend to cause um, larger water film buildup uh, around there. And a very good way or very easy way to uh, inadvertently introduce a localised flat spot is to have a crossfall transition in your road where you go from a positive crossfall to a negative crossfall or vice versa uh, along a portion of the road where the longitudinal grade is very low or flat. Now you can get away with some portions of flat road longitudinally as long as you have sufficient crossfall to get the water off the road quickly. However, if you transition the crossfall in one of these um, longitudinally flat areas, you're going to have a portion of the crossfall, a portion of the road where the crossfall is zero. Uh, and if the longitudinal grade is also zero, you have obviously introduced a flat spot in the road and that is likely to cause issues uh, in, or at least in causing the Galloway equation or the UK equation to generate a film depth, a water film depth greater than four millimetres, which is a red flag in the design process and suggests that you need to go back and modify the geometry so that you can pass this test. Um, another option, or another way of um, increasing the risk though is not having a um, good enough transition rate. When you're crossfall transition, you might have sufficient longitudinal grade, uh, but when you transition the crossfall, you might transition it too slowly or too quickly. And that can affect the geometry and introduce flat spots and even adverse grades. Um, uh, if you're not careful. So you do have to transition the crossfall at a rate that suits the longitudinal grade as well. Because we're trying to get or keep the total slope of the road, which is a combination of the longitudinal grade and the crossfall, uh, within reasonable limits. We don't want it too flat, and we don't want it too steep, generally speaking. And lastly, um, any geometry that allows for long flow paths to develop on the road surface and stay on the road surface. So it might be, for instance, a very steep road um, that um, can, uh, with, a, with a mild crossfall that will keep the flow on the road and then there might be sufficient curves in the road. Basically, as your flow path gets longer and longer, uh, even regardless of the slope of it, um, the, uh, the film depth does increase, so you don't want very long flow paths either. So I will be showing um, some examples in 12D in just a moment, but before we do that, I just wanted to pose the question here, how accurate are the risk assessments from these two methods? And I guess after doing a lot of uh, investigation into this topic, I would come back with, uh, they are, not terribly accurate, but they're not uh, terribly inaccurate either. It's somewhere in between. Aquaplaning is a very complex phenomenon, and the methods we use to assess the risk of aquaplaning are comparatively simple um, compared with the complexity of the actual problem. Uh, we simply relate the risk to the water film depth on the road surface, which is probably the primary risk but it's not, certainly not the only risk. There are other risk factors in aquaplaning as well, but we do simplify it by simply looking at the water film depth. Uh, we don't look at how that water film depth relates to 
uh, a particular storm event because the, the, according to research the water film depths do linger for some time after an intense burst of rainfall um, but that's not really accounted for in uh, the methods that have been developed. Uh, and the other thing, the big thing here is that um, when these two formulas were developed, they were t uh, developed using test rigs where all the flow paths were dead straight, all of the flow paths were less than 15 metres long, and all of the flow paths were on constant grades. Now that's, that was fine and, and, uh, and was perfectly adequate for developing these um, uh, formulas that are quite reliable for those conditions, but in the real world, the road surfaces that typically pose the greatest risk of aquaplaning are along the transitions in crossfall. There are potentially other places as well, but primarily it is the crossfall transitions. And at those places, the flow path is not straight, it is curved, and the flow path has a variable grade. It typically starts off steep, then it goes flat, then it goes steep again, and that's a pretty classical profile for a uh, crossfall transition flow path. And the flow path may be much longer than 15 metres. Uh, both uh, formulas and both methods assume that the estimations are still applicable to the real, these real world cases, uh, but the validity is not really clear. It's never really been um, proven. Overall, as I've already mentioned, the Galloway method is considered to be more reliable and less conservative than the UK method. Having said that, both methods should be considered as benchmark tests only. We are not talking about absolute risk in any way, shape or form. We are talking about uh, whether it is uh, better than some benchmark or worse than some benchmark. Uh, and that's about as far as one should take it. Uh, the other thing to note is um, a design that just passes a test has the same effective risk as, the, as a design that just fails a test. So if you're hovering around that four millimetre mark, if you're at 4.1 and you adjust the design a little bit to give it 3.9, you're still talking about the same effective risk. It is not that precise. There are um, error tolerances all over the place in the test data, so it's not like uh, suddenly you don't have a problem. You should be aiming, uh, if, if you are concerned about high risks of aquaplaning, you should be aiming to be uh, you know, below the, uh, well, in, ideally below 2.5, but certainly below, well below 4, possibly below 3.2 millimetres, um, as far as uh, the research suggests. Uh, so now let's have a look at uh, what all of this sort of thing looks like in 12D model. What I have here is a, um, a road design project where we have about 70, uh, about 7 kilometres of highway here. Uh, we can see the plan view here, we've got a few intersections and so forth. The cyan and magenta lines are marking where the sags and the crests are, respectively. Uh, down here on the section view, we have the, uh, the uh, profile of the main control line there, uh, showing where the crests and sags are. And if you look carefully, there's these little white blobs on the view. And if I zoom into some of these, this is where I have gone through, or whoever, the design, could be the designer, I, I was not the road designer in this case, I was the drainage designer, but it's a job for either one of those people typically. Uh, going through, looking at the areas of road surface, so you're only interested in where the vehicles travel here, we're not interested in footpaths or anything else like that. So you can ignore all of those, just the road surfaces. And we're looking primarily for transitions in the crossfall on the road surface. And wherever we do, we draw a little flow path string. And you can make the contours um, uh, more fine or less coarse by um, improving the interval there. And we can see this is a particularly weird one there. But if we look along at some of the others, there's one there. If we zoom out a bit, I can see there's a... Uh, a more common uh, one around about here, where we see the crossfall uh, is transitioning from a uh, from a positive crossfall there, or uh, to a negative crossfall, or vice versa. I may have got that around the wrong way. 
and the typical pattern there is at some point along the mid the middle there, uh, the cross fall goes to zero. So if you don't have any longitudinal slope there, you're going to get a flat spot in the road. In this case, it looks pretty good. And what we have here on the section view, I'll just set those contours back to 100 mils. Uh, what we have here on the section view then uh, is a profile of the finished surface tin. And you can just see there, it's a little bit subtle, you can just see that uh, sort of classical profile where we have a steep section at the beginning and then it flattens out around the curve where the, where the flow path makes a bend and then it goes steep again. And what we're typically doing to create these flow paths is we look at the point where the crossfall goes to zero and we look at the maximum extent on the road and it's around about this point here. And so we'd normally uh, use the contours to draw our flow paths if we're drawing them manually. Uh, we can use the contours as a guide to draw upstream and then downstream. We typically want to start the flow path uh, where the water is going to start forming uh, and the water is basically going to sheet flow along this path direction there, gradually building up from the top here where, it, where the uh, thing starts all the way here to the corner and down and we stop it here on the edge of the, of the trafficable lane. The water will continue on in the verge and the shoulder and whatever, but that's not where the cars are going to be travelling, so we don't need to uh, model that any further. Now, as I said, you can draw these manually or you can, uh, from the drainage sewer menu, you can use the raindrop option and that's a perfectly viable option for producing these two. You can uh, have it set up pretty much just as is there and uh, pick on the, the midpoint there and it will work its way upstream and downstream to try and find or estimate the flow path. You do have to have a nice regular uh, design tin to do that with, uh, with good intervals and so forth, uh, but it does do the job for you if that's uh, the way you'd like to do it. It's, uh, again, it's, it's totally up to the user which way we go there. So for this particular job where we've got sort of about seven kilometres, there's really not that many locations along here where we've located crossfall transitions. It's really not much more than half a dozen locations there. Uh, and so the task of actually drawing the flow path is not that great. Where the big time saver comes is in this panel here, the aquaplaning risk assessment panel. And what this panel is designed to do is analyse these flow path strings. Now these were simply drawn in two dimensions. We didn't care about the level, we just used the contours as a guide using super strings from the CAD control bar there and we just drew them in. We put the flow line arrows on there so we could remind ourselves which way the contours are falling. That's all it was. Uh, 12D now is going to analyse this using this panel. Now if you're really paying attention and you've used this option before, you might have noticed that this particular panel doesn't quite match the panel that you get from the current version. And this is the current version here, 11C1I. That's because I've made some recent modifications to this panel. The panel actually, the standard panel, is from the, design, uh, from the drainage menu, aquaplaning risk, looks very, very similar in fact. But there's one extra field now called the water film depth method. And we ha now have two methods. Previously, it only just ran the Galloway equation, which is the one that's actually the, the recommended method for Australia. However, at the moment for the New Zealand case, for the New Zealand market, the, the road authority there appears to be in a state where they um, allow the use of both with preference to the UK formula, uh, but they do note that the UK formula does give uh, more conservative results. So I, I, would rec I would guess that the New Zealand Transport Authority, you need access to both equations at the moment, and so that's what we've added in. Now, that will become available as a standard beyond V11C1I, but if anybody needs it uh, right now, I can, we can get in contact with us, and I can provide a copy for anyone who's using version 11. So I'll continue on using my modified version there, um, and it's really as simple as deciding which equation you want to use, but other than that, it's all identical. 
In the case of the UK equation, it simply ignores the texture depth because that's not used in the, uh, in the UK equation. Um, other than that, in terms of getting um, the results, what 12D is going to do uh, with this panel is look at your flow path strings, uh, however many are in this model called the uh, aqua risk, uh, and it's going to modify these strings by analysing them, setting the levels based on the tin. So you can draw these as 2D, it will drape them automatically on your tin. There's our road pavement tin there, our design tin. Uh, if we want to, we can specify um, a control line or a reference string as well, and this will automatically name our flow path strings relative to the chainage of the reference string. So it will name them based on the, um, the chainage and the offset of the center point of the flow path string there, rounded to the nearest sort of 10 meters, uh, and then it will sort all of those strings by chainage as well. So it is quite handy to do that by reference string. It makes it a lot easier to find your, um, your strings. Uh, the rainfall intensity I've touched on already, typically it's 50 millimetres per hour, but other values are used. In New Zealand it can be 70 or 80 millimetres per hour in some cases. Pavement texture depth is a number typically between 0.2 and 4 millimetres. Uh, it's only used in the Galloway equation. Uh, most jobs I've seen in the real world tend to use values between 0.4 and 0.9 for the texture depths used on most freeways and motorways and highways these days. Um, 0.4, mathematically at least, is the number that tends to give the highest film depth. So it's the least good texture depth for reducing texture depths, uh, for, for reducing film depths, I should say. The big one here. Uh, that's important to understand is the flow path slope mode. And we've got two choices here, equal area or average. Now remember I mentioned that the slope of a typical um, flow path, and I'll see if I can find that one again. There it is, if I zoom right in. A typical flow path starts steep at the top section, goes flat in, or flatter in the middle section, and then goes steep again at the bottom section. That's a variable slope. Now the equations only cover a constant slope and we're going to be analysing this path uh, at, all, uh, at a number of different locations along the path. At each point we need to estimate what the slope of the string is from the top to the point of interest and if it's a variable slope we need to come up with a reasonable way. Now we provide two methods but I would generally recommend only the equal area. The advantage of the equal area over the average slope is that it tends to have the effect of weighting the slope towards the downstream end of um, the path that you're interested in. So in this case, where it's slightly flatter in the middle, the equal area slope will be slightly flatter than the average slope. Um, and that is uh, probably quite reasonable considering that most of the flow rate or the flow volume will have concentrated at the downstream portion because the flow increases as the flow moves downstream. So that is the real advantage of the equal area slope and that's what I would recommend. Guidelines from the authorities on this matter are um, a little bit lacking and uh, some places they do specify equal area some places they don't mention it at all and, and kind of imply average slope and in some authorities again they even imply instantaneous slope which we don't support because I just can't see how it could be considered correct. So we provide these two and I thoroughly recommend equal area in preference to any other regardless of which equation you use. Uh, when we uh, analyze these strings and set the Z values, we have the option to either set the Z values to what the road tin is or to what the actual film depth calculated is in millimeters. So that's an option as well. I normally leave it to this one, that's perfectly okay. And then there's some, a few technical settings there for how many um, times we're going to subdivide this input string because uh, we'll analyze it. So uh, We'll break this one into 100 segments and analyze um, uh, each one of those vertices uh, and color code them. 
uh, and we'll report it at a lesser interval, so every 10 points we'll report the results. Uh, this section here, water film depth, risk levels and other warnings, uh, uh, we can, uh, well, basically we can assign colour codes to various depths and again, these are as largely prescribed by the Queensland main roads. Other road authorities may prescribe uh, different uh, risk levels and that is largely at the discretion of the road authority or your verifier. Um, a, a few places also uh, put in extra um, things saying that they don't want the depth rate to build up too quickly, uh, millimetres per metre there, and they don't want the flow path length to exceed uh, a certain distance there. Other than that though, we can simply go ahead and run the analysis. It's going to generate a report file, but that report file will also be written to the Windows clipboard, which means you can paste it straight into Excel. So let's go ahead and run that now. And in my case, it said there's seven flow path strings. Three are considered unacceptable risks, so they've been colored red, uh, and none have been untested. So they've all been tested. Four of them are fine or, or better than unacceptable, uh, and three of them are, are considered unacceptable. So if I can profile that one now, I can see this particular one has passed the test, it's gone up to a moderate risk towards the end of the string there. And again, you can't really get too analytical here. I wouldn't say that the cutoff point in reality is right where it's gone from green to yellow. I would say that basically this whole section of road is at risk. You wouldn't just say it's the portion uh, where the yellow is because where that cutoff point is, there is some uncertainty there because we've got a variable slope and so forth. I, I don't think you should be too analytical there. Uh, if I look at some other results there, I can see I do have one result here around the chainage 15,000 mark, which is around about there. Where is it? Sorry, that's 12,000. Can't read. Where is it? There it is. And you can see straight away here, the problem with this one is we've generated a flat spot on the road. You can see the contours get very, very flat around here. Uh, and uh, we've suddenly got um, the equation, the Galloway equation, complaining bitterly that it's well over uh, its threshold of four millimetres. Uh, and you can see on the profile, on the section view here, we've got uh, quite a flat spot there. Uh, generated because probably because of not so much the slope of the longitudinal grade but because of the rate of rotation there it's either too fast or too slow or something like that that's caused a change in the geometry there. Uh, so uh, other things we can do it's not to, all of the results are stored as vertex attributes so we've broken the string into a hundred little segments with 101 vertices and you can look at the results on each one of those vertices under strings, properties, attributes and look at the vertex tab there. Uh, I won't bother going through that. Another way of looking at the results though is once you've run the panel here and the results are not only in this file but on the Windows clipboard, you can open up a, a, an Excel file and here's one. Uh, is there is a Excel template specifically for the ACRA planning report that we store in the library and ship in the library. It's called um, ACRA planning report template.xlsx or XLS. And once you've got it open, it looks like this. You can just control V and paste the report straight in there. And it automatically color codes your results based on the numbers that came in from the report. Okay, so it is quite um, visually easy to see where you've got problems and where you don't. All of the flow paths have been sorted by chainage and offset and names there, that's what the flow path ID. So the, mac, the, the panel has actually, or the macro has actually assigned these names. You don't have to make up the names yourself. And it's reported um, every 10 or an even um, 10 points along each flow path and done an assessment of what the equal area slope is and what the depth is and what depth risk that represents. 
Uh, and this is pretty much the standard report format required by all the road authorities. Uh, something very similar. There wouldn't be, there would only be cosmetic differences um, between the different authorities. Uh, and again, this is just our version of the template. You could um, take this information and present it in a different format and simply paste the results from 12D into your formatted Excel template to get the style of report that you like. Uh, so that's an easy way of generating the reports. We can also, once you've got the strings in this form and analysed them, we have a plot parameter file designs uh, under the plots menu, under long sections. If you look to the library, there is one called Acroplaning Long Section A4. I've got a local copy here and that one simply you specify your model of pro, uh, strings to profile as your flow paths model and it's set up to plot to an A4 sheet to give you results like this for each individual flow path. So it shows the profile of the string and the plan components as well. Uh, and that's a, a very quick way of documenting that. You can uh, plot that to a PDF uh, to, to get a, and tack that onto the end of a report. Uh, as, a, as a quick way of documenting this. So a lot of the time in 12D, it's not so much that we've come up with this amazing way of um, determining or assessing the risk of aquaplaning. The assessment of the risk is still as uh, uncertain as it ever has been. The Galloway equation has been around since 1979. What we do have though is a tool that uh, takes a lot of the labour out of the process as a road designer um, on, on actually um, assessing these flow paths and reporting them in the, in the uh, ways that they need to be reported and documented. So that's where the big time saving is uh, and I think that's about uh, where I'll have to leave it because I've gone a little bit over time. So I will now the uh, PowerPoint and I'll open the, uh, the webinar up to any questions. Thanks, Owen. Yes, I think we've got time for a few questions. Arvind of Brisbane asks why the maximum flow path is limited to 60 metres. Uh, sometimes flow depth is less than 2.5 millimetres but considered non-compliant because of length. Uh, well, technically it's not limited. Um, it is uh, in New South Wales, I believe, and that's where this um, setting on the panel came from, there was, a, I'm not sure if it's still current, but at the time I was uh, working on a project, there was a requirement to limit the flow path to 60 metres. Now, I think my, the argument is probably that um, 60 metres is so far beyond the 15 metres, which is the maximum extent that the Galloway equation was based on. They never tested any flow path longer than 15, 15 metres. So 60 metres is four times that. Uh, and so I guess there is uh, some question mark over whether the Galloway equation is still valid for such a long flow path. Okay, and uh, Matt from Perth has asked, which version of 12D will have the RRL equation as well as the Galloway? Uh, yeah, it will start shipping standard in all versions after V11C1I, but if you'd like a copy of it beforehand, as long as you're running version 11, you can get in contact with us and we can provide, because it's a macro, it can ship independently of the version of, uh, of 12D, so it can just slot in to an earlier version of the 11 if you don't want to wait for um, the next version of 12D. Great, and um, we'll do one more. Jack in Sydney would like to know, why doesn't 12D draw the flow paths to be assessed? Uh, well, um, it does in a way, and if you use, if you choose to use the um, the raindrop option or the teardrop option that I uh, showed briefly uh, earlier on, uh, that's a good tool for making it work. In terms of going around and identifying the areas, um, no, we don't do that, and I think. Um, generally speaking, that's a, a comparatively trivial um, job com compared with the um, the labour required to actually go and analyse the flow paths once you've got them. So yes, 
you um, you do need to draw the flow paths, but it really doesn't take very long. I mean, in our example, which is a fairly typical example of seven kilometres of of um, of highway, I only had to draw you know half a dozen, no more than a dozen um, flow paths, and that took virtually no time at all. So yes, it would be quite a difficult algorithm to go and identify um, every potential crossfall transition and and looking at you know where the trafficable lanes are as well and all and the relationship of that. Uh, we figured we'd put the effort into analysing the flow paths rather than drawing them. So a lot some people do prefer to draw them manually. Other people prefer to use that raindrop tool. But yeah, as far as actually automatically. Um, finding all of the potential locations to test, no, we don't have anything like that. Thank you, Owen. That's all we've got time for in the live Q&A today. Sorry to those whose questions we couldn't get to live, but we'll get back to you individually afterwards. The recording of this webinar will be available in coming days through our website and our YouTube channel. Our next two industry solutions webinars will be 12D regional and global work sharing, on the 17th of May and 12D International Conference 2016 preview on the 8th of June. In case you haven't heard, we're also holding What's New in 12D webinars from the 24th till the 26th of May and we'll be continuing our training webinar series next week, so do see our website for details of all of those. We'll keep updating the website with many more topics in coming weeks and also keep you posted through email and social media. And don't forget, we've also got our next 12D International Conference this July with the Associated Innovation Awards. The awards closing date is now the end of May, so if you haven't submitted your entry, you've still got some time. If you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you so much for attending and we hope to see you at future webinars.